Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-host Ann Fernald and I welcome you to the Twice Over podcast, because to teach is to learn twice over. In this episode, Scaling My Abilities, we're joined by Matt Arts, business anthropologist and professor at the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University, who shares his thoughts about artificial intelligence and its possible effects on teaching and learning. Welcome back to the Twice Over podcast. I'm so excited to have as our guest today a professor at the Gabelli School of Business, Matt Arts. He is a business and design anthropologist, and he's also a podcaster. We're really excited to have this conversation. And the reason that Steve and I were drawn to you, Matt, comes from a a post that you posted to the Fordham listserv on teaching. And in that post, you had this very calm response to faculty anxiety about OpenAI's release of chat GPT, especially around plagiarism. And you said, I'm going to quote you to yourself, while I acknowledge the tools create academic issues, especially as it relates to essays and other such work, it's also an opportunity to teach students new skills. NLG and more broadly NLU are critical to performance on the web and have been since Google started shifting from strings to things in 2011. Understanding how to use these tools effectively is an important differentiator. Maybe we should do that in our classes. And I was like, I don't even know what NLG and NLU are, let alone how to talk to my students about them. So can you just bring me up to speed and we'll start our conversation there? Sure. Thanks for having me on. So yeah, I have a a, a feeling or a belief that this is an opportunity more that it's the sort of end of academia. And it's like any other new skill. It's like when the internet came out. It's like when calculators came out. It's like when Wikipedia came out and you couldn't cite that, but now people cite it, right? There's these shifts that happen and we simply need to adapt. Culture is always changing, always always on the move. It's always diffusing and it's always adapting and we need to adapt with it. And this is it is a radical. The open AI tools and everything that's about to come after it is a radical change for society, but it's simply one that is here. We need to figure it out and we need to make use of it. And on top of it, it is already a skill that people need to know how to use in their jobs. We have been using such tools for about 20 months on a near daily basis. And so I just want to lead with that. But back to your question, NLG or natural language generation is a discipline or a sub-discipline, I guess you would say, as is natural language understanding of a broader family of natural language processing, which relates more broadly to AI, just nested disciplines within nested disciplines. NLG is the new player on the block. Chat GPT has ruffled some feathers, especially in academia. But the reality is the tools have been around for a bit. They've been getting better over many years. And it has a lot of benefits that we can probably get into. And those are starting to unfold and best practices are being developed in a near daily basis. And we're all figuring out how to go about using those. The NLG tools are maybe the newest person on the block, if you will. NLU, or natural language understanding, we've been using for a longer period of time to make sense of purposes of text out on the web from using it for academic research to basically see what are the main topic clusters in an individual paper maybe you're working on as the author. You know, does it actually represent the ideas you're trying to communicate? To comparing maybe your work to another body of work and seeing what are the similarities and differences. To using it in search marketing to understand the entities, concepts that exist in some content that maybe you want to outrank as a brand. So we've been using NOU in a lot of ways. I, as an academic, use it in some of those academic ways that I mentioned. In a consulting perspective, in the type of work that we do, we're using more from the sort of search marketing perspective. We're also using it to understand customer sentiment. So sentiment analysis would be part of this kind of broad family of tools, if you will. And so it has... Explain a little bit more about what sentiment analysis is. Are you looking at Yelp reviews or is that that the kind of thing you you could could get as a data set? Yeah, anything. So like I have an upcoming keynote in the Global Business Anthropology Conference in June. And so right now I've done a number of things using these tools. And I'll just use this as a quick case study. So I've gone and I scraped 10 years of the Journal of Business Anthropology to look how the conversation has changed over time, to look at what's present in the conversation, what's not present. Enough digital methods are not present. You know, 
what we're talking about today, right? Ironic. But um, I'm also scraping content and looking at the discourse around business anthropology. How do people speak of it? Again, is it spoken of in a positive way? Is it spoken in a negative way? You could, again, in that same LinkedIn text, you could look what are the main sort of topical clusters, basically the ideas that people are talking about, if you will. And from that, you can start to inform certain things. I'm doing it for this presentation, but you could, of course, do it with Yelp reviews if you're a business and you want to know how customers are perceiving your business and essentially writing about your business on the web. The Twitterscape and just understand what's being talked about in politics. What is the perception of chat GPT? I'm doing a similar thing where I'm looking at time slices of this journal over 10 years and looking at, again, what shows up, when when does it drop out of the conversation. In the case of the business anthropology thing, digital methods are not present, even as recent as 2022. And then there's things that appear to be changing about the conversation, like organizational culture is just seemingly not as in vogue in, in the journal anymore as it once was in its early days, which sort of makes sense because design has taken over all of well, much of the business world, design, research, user experience. That's where a lot of the people are working today. And so you see that in the conversation. So what tools would you use to do, because you're not using chat GPT to do the kinds of research you're describing. So there are other natural language processing tools that could look at unstructured data in the way that you're describing that you have access to? Yeah. So the first thing is, of course, you need to capture the data. And there are various ways people go about that from brute force to, to scraping data. I myself am not a software engineer, so I use often like low code, or no code tools. And so in all honesty, like I am maybe somewhat limited of what I can grab unless I use more of a brute force approach, which is generally not desirable. So in terms of certain tools, so there's tools to go out and scrape data and collect data. If you want to, there's even services these days. If you want to go get the Twitter scape, you can go, I forget the site right now. You just go to it, you pay $50 for five fifty thousand credits and you can scrape, I think, 50,000 tweets. So you can grab data like that. Then... There is the analysis tool, so something like Core Text can help you do some of this sort of semantic analysis that we're talking about. And there's many tools in that space. Of course, a lot of those tools will visualize data as well, but there are other platforms that also help visualize data to maybe relationships between topical clusters. Can you talk a little bit about the uses of natural language generation? To put it in maybe like a business perspective, it does a pretty good job of writing marketing copy, which is not going to get super specific. As long as you're feeding it the proper prompts, it doesn't necessarily need to have access to the most recent data because as you've probably heard, it's cut off at 2021. And something like marketing copy, it works pretty well. There's another tool that I've used for about 20 months. That's The name is Jasper. It used to be another name. And it's based on GPT-3. And they have now been funded by OpenAI as of about two months ago. And it offers like recipes to do or little templates to do a whole suite of things. So again, marketing copy, you could write ad headlines for Google ads, Facebook ads, you can write social media posts. You can do things like convert features to benefits. So we build mobile apps at my organization. Well, we build software applications in general, but you could take the feature, say, of a mobile app and it, it does social networking, it does this, it does that, and then flip it so that it's more likely to speak to the consumer in a way that resonates with them as opposed to trying to sell on features. And so there's there's all those opportunities in the, and many more, of course, in business. In the academic space, you could certainly put in copy and get out questions that you might want to ask your students. You could use it to brainstorm ideas for papers, for journal articles, for presentations, have it help you with the outlines of presentations. Everybody's very concerned with it writing large blocks of text like essays, and it does that pretty well depending on the subject matter, and it will do it better over time without, without a doubt. And yes, that seems like a threat, and we're not necessarily using it to do that, but there is an opportunity there in the future. In the short run, we use it for very small chunks of text and for, again, things like outlines, FAQs. It's great for summarizing data. It does a fantastic job to almost have a conversation with you, right, in, given the chat interface. 
it's an assistant, really. And that's really what it's meant to be. That's what all these tools are meant to be. They're tools. They're meant to be assistants to humans. They're not meant to replace us, in a sense. And I use it to brainstorm with, largely, you could say, to bounce my ideas off of, to tweak them, to maybe I have 800 words and I want it to be more concise. You know, give me back a more concise version of this text that helps weed out some of my superfluous language that really is almost irrelevant. One of the advantages is that I'll never look at a blank Word document again. I can always just ask it a question and it'll get me started. Even if that response is not valuable, it just gives me some object to direct my attention towards rather than nothing. So yeah. it's, it really comes down to the effort you put in is somewhat equivalent to the output. Can you talk a little bit about the difference then between the current chat GPT and GPT-3? Yes, so I don't know what the guardrails are exactly, but it would be much harder to get hate speech out of it. It's much harder to, not, I'm not saying it's impossible. People have demonstrated that it is possible, but it really tries to have a very neutral conversation is from my experience. Whereas there are other tools on the market that you can ask questions and it just will spit out what it's digested on the internet. And you know, to your point, to the point you were just making, you really got to, we need to appreciate that all this is like a word counter and like, and generation based on like those counts, right? So what words go together and what is the likelihood that these words should be together to formulate an answer? It very much lacks context still. And so in the anthropology space, it's not very useful to have a nuanced conversation about human culture. So do you feel, I've been wondering this, if there will be discipline specific, highly technical open AIs that practitioners could use. I have an article coming out actually in Anthropology News where I'm arguing for that. And I have another paper coming out with the Live Center partnership with UNESCO. My, the first one is basically saying that we need like an anthropology specific language model, which likely will be a spinoff of one of these large language models. You wouldn't it probably is not advisable to just actually start with a small subset of data and only train on that because then it's going to lack the general knowledge context. My hunch is that you will see thing models branching off of of some of these larger language models. Because of course, OpenAI is not the only large language model that exists. All the big tech players have it. And it's very plausible that Google's is better when they choose to get around to releasing it. But so there almost certainly will be specific language models that people will spin up. Even now you can sign up for the API of GPT-3 and you can start using that and incorporating that into your, your own applications. And so there's no reason people couldn't be doing that today. And I'm sure some people already are. The other aspect though, is that right now there's a little bit of an obsession with language models because of the release of chat GPT. Again, it lacks context. It's not up to date. It will never be fully up to date, right? There is no way to ingest all new information in real time consistently around the globe. So it will always be trailing. And especially in things like the sciences where there is papers that come out with, I'm just going to call them major breakthroughs, but there are other opportunities here. So there's concept of knowledge graphs, which help you, and that's what my second paper is on, which help you structure data into essentially like an ontology where you basically say these concepts are related. And I see a world where we're basically combining knowledge graphs with language models, which quite frankly is what Google's working on and has been working on. And, when, and that goes back to, the, to what you cited or quoted in the beginning. My point there was that in 2010 or 2011, Google bought Freebase and then in 2012-ish, they rolled out the Google Knowledge Graph, which was essentially their understanding of the relationships between entities in the world. So it could be a academic and the books they've written, the journal articles they've written. And so if you were to Google my name in, depends on like where you are and if you're on mobile or web, but if you were to Google Mad Arts, you likely will see some variation of a knowledge panel in Google search that refers to me as an anthropologist that typically has like music that I make attached to that. It lists that I'm affiliated with Fordham. It lists my education. It lists my publications, right? And all of that is because Google understands me as an entity and the relationships to this, just I'm going to call content that I've created. 
And so I'm in Google's knowledge graph, and thus they show a representation of everything that I've created. And they can do that because the, these relationships are explicit. And they have inferred those, but I've also helped them, helped Google understand those relationships. And so like I see a world where there are disciplinary specific knowledge graphs and language models that the language models are basically leveraging the knowledge graphs to look for the very clearly defined relationships. And we're using these technologies together to produce something that is even more sophisticated and more capable of complex understanding and analysis and even, of course, complex generation then. But that's there is certainly going to be niche-specific language models. Let's zoom back a little bit and talk about business anthropology as a field. Can you talk to us a little bit about how those two fields, one of which is anthropology typically housed in a arts and sciences college, and the other is a profit-driven business college, and you're bringing them together. Can you talk to us a little bit about what the discipline is and what the value you're bringing kind of tools of anthropology and business together as a way of understanding the world? Sure. So yeah, there's many practitioners who have come far before me in this field and late to the game in many respects. But starting, there, there's a history that goes back, let's say, to the 40s. But in more, in more recent times, say in the 80s, you get a big burst of activity where anthropologists start really spending a lot of time engaged in what was generally referred to as organizational culture and consumer behavior, and you start getting individuals marketing and advertising. So you had these individuals who were in these spaces. And late 80s, 90s, and especially into the 2000s, design starts becoming a big thing. And so you would get anthropologists working in all of these fields. And originally, these anthropologists, most were trained as academic anthropologists in the classic sort of four-field approach. And they just happened to be trendsetters who went off and decided that they wanted to work in consulting or within organizations. And they started to, of course, define what this field looks like. And today, while probably most of us go into UX, there are still plenty of people working in marketing, advertising, consumer behavior, organizational culture. But what this generally looks like is you're either a consultant or you're working in an organization and you're working in one of those roles that I speak of. And we are generally recommending that we need to bring certain tools, certain approaches, certain methods, theories to bear on business because there are sometimes missed opportunities with existing business-only approaches. And so essentially what one of the kind of hallmarks that we say is that you need to observe, right? We need to see for ourselves because what people do is often different than what people say. So we don't believe that surveys. Always, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My Fordham calendar has almost no relationship to how I spend my day. Quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. And there's a great story there. So I studied under Dr. Susan Squires at the University of North Texas, and she's written about in many of the anthropology books, journals, et cetera, for helping to define and create Gogurt, which was a multi-million dollar opportunity. And what she observed in the household, what she heard was all parents, we feed our kids healthy food. It's peaceful and idyllic. There's birds flying around. And everybody's at peace in the morning. And she goes into the homes and she's observing. Of course, everybody's running around late. Nobody eats a breakfast. They get in the car. They take a banana with them because it's portable. And based on those observations and think of the form of a banana, you end up with Gogurt. And so that's the kind of insights that that's anthropologists... So high. Oh my God, my kids still, they're old teenagers and they still eat applesauce in tubes. Like the, no, not so much Gogurt anymore, but still like the thing that you squeeze and can eat it as you walk to high school remains a very useful, funny thing. That's great. Yeah. It's a packaging that fits the need. Do you think that there there should be, or in the future there would be, a department of business anthropology where students could take this as a major. I wouldn't be opposed to it. Of course, that's something that is up to the university. Because I feel like it could be a really rich, a fruitful way to, to get students whose inclinations are in the humanities, but really there could be maybe a kind of juxtaposition there, a career path that many students wouldn't even be aware of that they might be well suited for. Well, what I think I'd like to see more is even beyond having some concept of like a department of business anthropology or some more formally defined group would be 
something that brings together business, design, tech, data science, let that, we'll lump that into tech, and the social sciences together. Because on a daily basis, that it really is what my work looks like, working in a tech company. And I don't see how most younger, how most students are going to make it without skills in all of those places if they want to go into the sort of business world proper. Today, I was working with tools to th synthesize voice because we want to basically, why pay for voiceover actors when we should be able to, at least within the next 18 months, be using all these other tools to like, to understand the sentiment, to use that to guide like the way we prompt and generate marketing copy, then to use text to speech to synthesize it. And there's even the opportunity to convert that into video. I appreciate that has societal ramifications, especially for labor. When you're a startup and we simply do not have the resources to shop all of this out or to do it all by ourselves, we need assistive tools. And so we use these tools. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's an article I read about how the audiobook industry is feeling some pressure because of the text to speech capabilities. And there is some pushback from prominent voice actors who do audiobooks saying that their style, their voices have been taken to, in the building of these kinds of tools. I'm like, I'm, I narrate books and now there's this tool that sounds almost exactly like me and it's reading books now. So that the implications there for kind of, as you say, labor, but really the appropriation of artistic or performative efforts. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to shake out. I would like to think that there are still going to be a demand. I would like to think that there are books that are always going to go to a human voiceover actor, if you will. And then there are other books that simply don't have the budget to do that, and they need assistance to get there. And I appreciate the Asian aspect for sure. And of course, all of the text to image generation is also being See, it also fits into that problem. And this this is a problem of AI in general in that, of course, there needs to be training data and that training data comes from somewhere. And so that's definitely an issue that needs to be worked through and there are certainly governance concerns to work out. But yeah, these are also likely things, likely changes in the market that are going to happen in some form. And so now to bring it all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, this is why I think students need to be learning this stuff. The ethical questions are absolutely at the heart of, it seems to me, the anthropological questions, but also in a Fordham context, right, Jesuit education. So you think about, on the one hand, I want to make sure that voice actors get to keep working and it would be a shame to replace them. And I share your sense that there are certain books that probably will always be read by an actor and that won't be well served by even the most sophisticated computerized voice. And yet I have a kid who is reading Dangerous Liaisons for an AP literature class in high school now, and that's an 18th century novel translated from the French. There is no audiobook of that novel. And my kid has some challenges reading and really benefits from reading along with an audiobook. And boy, if someone could feed that into a computer and could have helped them do their homework, it would have been a tremendous benefit. There are issues of ac accessibility that are massive. There's a ton of text in the world that hasn't been converted to audiobook, and not all of it needs to be artisanally read by a Tony Award-winning actor or actress. It might just be, I need the information from this philosophy book that, I, that has never been read before. Yeah, absolutely. When I was doing my, my, uh, my anthropology degree, I would, in very rudimentary text-to-speech, I would do it, convert it, because I'd want to take it essentially as like a podcast on my device on the go, right? And listen to it in between all of my other activities. It's in be incredibly helpful because I think through speech, a tool like that where I can just talk into it and it types everything I am saying at the speed in which I'm saying it so I can formulate my thoughts without having to type them out. Although I do worry that Anne's argument is what she's going to tell me when she replaces me on the podcast with an AI. And so there's also tech that already exists to do transcription and live transcription. And over the past few years, it's made really substantial changes. When I was working on my thesis in 2018, I was playing with a lot of these tools and they weren't up to the speed to really 
include in the thesis. They weren't at the level that I felt that I should include it at the time. But fast forward and like Whisper AI, which is also from OpenAI, is unbelievable speech to text. I can't believe how well it does. And it will get packaged into products in probably the next six months, maybe 18 months at the longest, but I would imagine much sooner. I suspect you will see it very early on Q1, Q2. I would really think you would see products with it. And it's great. It really does a good job of getting almost all of the content right. Whereas in the past, I would have to spend still a fair amount of time cleaning up transcripts. It gets me 90% of the way there now. It's pretty amazing, even just what my phone can do when it transcribes a voice message. It's a mess on the one hand. On the other hand, I can look at my phone and know what the basic, who called me and what basically they said. So I can only imagine what the better is going to be. I feel like anybody who calls me and leaves a voicemail is not the message I really want. <laughs> Frankly, come on. What are we, what really, what are we doing? So I'm just wondering if you could maybe theorize or just talk a little bit about wh why do you think the reaction to open AI chat GPT from the teaching and learning community has been, I don't want to say negative, but centering really on issues of academic integrity rather than the framing you just used for text-to-speech capabilities as a scaffold or a tool. What accounts for teachers' anxiety around this new capability, do you think? I don't know that I have the answer, but I would just say on a more, from a, more, from a broader perspective, it is the norm that people resist change, right? We see it in the technology space all the time. And so change management is difficult. Y yes, there are threats to academic integrity, and there's potentially even threats to, to academic jobs because of tools like this. And I understand that causes some concern. I think it's, again, I think it's a broader sort of reaction or a reaction that represents a, just a broader sort of human way of responding to change, especially when it's very disruptive. And I appreciate there's maybe even some concerns about job, but I also don't think that it's productive necessarily to just ban it citywide like New York did. It's, these are tools that are going to be here in the near future for most people in some form, and we need to learn how to use them, how to govern them properly, how to teach students like the appropriate way to use these, not only in academia, but also in their jobs. If we can view it as assistive and help people realize that these are meant to be assistive agents as any sort of technology or innovation, it helps frame it in a context that it's not sort of us versus them, right? It's not us versus the tech, but it's really, it's a tool to work together. And to, I basically was describing it to somebody the other day as scaling my own abilities. It's not a replacement for my abilities, but I'm getting more done in a day than I used to be able to. And I want students to be able to do more, right? Like, why shouldn't they use it to help them write their resume? Put in the job posting that you want to apply to and have it help you understand the key concepts in there. And then use those key concepts, those topics, those keywords, those entities to help reframe your skills back. I'm not saying to use it to write a resume, but to guide you on the, maybe the hidden subtext that's within the posting and use that knowledge to, to inform yourself and use your abilities to respond to that better, to that job posting better. And why not use AI tools to help you create things for, if you need a portfolio, say, if you happen to be in a field that would need that. These are things that can help students perform better. I know some people will try to write essays using it. I, I get that's going to happen. And there's, be frank, there's not going to be much you can do about it. Actually, OpenAI released a tool today to see if it can detect its own code, its own output. And it, I already ran tests and it doesn't work on its own output. <laughs> oh, that's you know, the, great. <laughs> the CEO of OpenAI said he doesn't see there ever being a tool that can detect it. Because all you have to do, you take the text, you put it in Grammarly, you correct a few things in Grammarly, you put it, you pull it back out, it's already different text, and you put it in the, in the tool that's meant to detect it, it doesn't detect it. All right, so... Anybody who wants to get around it is going to just introduce a little bit of human language into that text and instantly the ability to detect it falls down. And I can tell you that this is happening and is happening in huge numbers on the web right now from a marketing perspective on a daily basis. That's what people have been doing in the SEO community. They've been using these tools for many months, for years now, like Jasper, like I have for 20 months. And you write content, you tweak it, 
And this is the reality we live in. Well, that's fascinating. And I have a couple of questions for you that arise out of that. And one of them is, if you're talking to a student at advanced undergrad, or if you're talking to a new employee, and you're in a situation where maybe you're encouraging them to use natural language generation tools to write copy, what's the advice you're giving people about how to do that tweaking that turns the boost that you get from having this predictive, predicted language that's automatically generated as a starting point? So you are an experienced writer. You've written a lot. You can look at it and say, oh, I need to shift this. I need to shift that. I'm going to change the wording of this. How do you have ideas about how to teach people how to become that kind of editor? You have to still have the, the ability to understand what is a good argument, right? And make sure that the, that's the foundation of all of this. It's, we still need to express our critical thinking skills, even about the text that's coming out. But I think there's ways to, yes, there'd be ways to teach people how to tweak it, to get by and make it better, to get by detectors, to, to make it better, to make it more human-like. And some of that I already said, but I think maybe what's more, maybe more useful is how do you detect when it's not good content? And what do you do about it? Something I said to the class the other night was that we'll likely do an exercise where we do a SWOT analysis and we'll maybe split the teams into, each team will be split into two groups. And each team, part of the team will, to do it the traditional way, part of the team can use chat GPT. And then we'll come together and we'll compare and contrast and see how maybe, maybe there's some things that are inaccurate in chat GPT. And we need to then obviously having that conversation will help us sort that out. But also maybe there's some creative things in there that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise, which is also helpful. So it's, I'll probably do an exercise like that's meant to help them see the pros and cons, if you will, or what's maybe beneficial or not accurate. Another way I see potentially using it would be not in writing like an essay per se, but in some of the examples I gave with marketing copy, or even where we'll be dealing with some organizational culture issues in this cross-cultural cross -cultural consumer behavior class. So there's some examples in the book, some little case studies, if you will. So if we did an analysis together as a group, what does the class say first about the case study? And then we could put the case study into ChatGPT and ask some questions of it and see what does it come out with? Do we think this is accurate? If it wasn't, what would we do about it? And again, maybe there's some novel ideas in there that none of us thought of, which is also interesting to observe and then to figure out what do we do with them. So one of the things that interests me about ChatGPT is that we don't it would take too much work to see the corpus that it's depending on, right? I don't have the bandwidth to figure out the corpus, but what it's spitting out is a prediction that's super, as I understand it, maybe I'm wrong, super kind of normy, right? It's trying to predict the most regular kind of observation. And as you say, it's never going to be caught up with the next thing, right? So our semester is innovation. And that's all about coming up with something that we can't yet foresee. And it's so interesting to me that this innovation that's really exciting and amazing technology is also always going to be like two steps behind the most interesting creative thing. So I'm wondering how you've thought about that and how that affects you're thinking about how we judge what chat GPC generates, because it strikes me that it's an interesting kind of puzzle, right? That chat GPT may be able to show us things we haven't already thought of, but it's not really able to be innovative. I think with enough prompting and guidance, you can actually make it pretty innovative. So I don't, even though that it may not have the most recent data, maybe that's not going to, maybe it's not going to help you with the hard sciences and doing some innovative, like identifying something innovative for you per se. But I do think you can push it, especially in the business space to come up with interesting ideas, somewhat that you have, but to help you extend those ideas. But I think in this conversation, we're also just bogged down on generation, which I think is, again, limiting. So you can take 
generated text, you can put that into natural language understanding tools and visualize like the conversation. And I'm not talking about a prompt that produces a few paragraphs. I'm talking about if you spend, you're in one chat in a sense with ChatGPT and you're spending hours working through concepts and which is something that I've done and you get, you start pushing it to a point where it is quite interesting, but then you can also take that corpus, if you will, and you can put that into tools that help you visualize what does that look like. And you can start to combine it with your own knowledge to see where are there gaps. You basically would get a map. Like you ever see like social network, a lot of the tools will do that kind of mapping for you. So where are the gaps? Where are the interconnections? What isn't connected? And maybe that's something that you want to explore. But you can use those same tools, again, to go out and do this on the web. Imagine you you just go into, you download all the queries that people would ask in Google of some given topic, right? So like I was saying this to my wife last night, who's a medical doctor. So, you know, a lot of science papers about patient-centered care write about it from the perspective of building on previous research. And you know how research goes. Sometimes it's incremental, right? In the sort of journal article world. Some, I'm not saying that this is a real, I'm not saying that this would actually be true if I did this analysis, but you might find that if you were to look at what are patients asking for in some way in that space, just by using data from the web, which you can get, and then comparing it to all of the data that's in like those journal articles, and you map that, you might see that there are big discrepancies that give you, point you in a direction of where you might want to go from an innovation perspective. And so while generation, natural language generation alone may not help you with that, AI can help you with that when we talk about it more broadly. I feel like the future is going to be just like a goop kind of AI. If you have a headache, it's your chakras are misaligned and you need this essential oil and you could buy it here. So then I feel like that's like way more likely. Of course, I should be careful if an AI actually hears this. I just want to be clear that I was joking and I think AI is great because... Well, and hey, I will hear it because Google's, mo <laughs> Google's mom, which is what replaced Bert or slowly replacing Bert, starting rolling out in 2021, is the next wave, which is multimodal AI. So multimodal AI basically, not in the case of that, is not just looking at text, but is using text and audio. And say, if you have uh, an article on a website, what does the text say? What is the image? What's, what's in the image? How does that all relate? Is this the best content for somebody? If you have a video there or a blog post, it would be able to analyze the audio in either of those. I'm not suggesting they would be doing it on all sites because it would be computationally expensive. They probably are doing it on the biggest sites, would be my guess. Could be wrong about that. But point is, and I will hear you in the future, and it will determine how does that make the content better or worse. I hear, it, I hear a drone flying overhead. <laughs> it's so interesting because one of the new frontiers in first year writing pedagogy is multimodal composition. And one of the things that made me resist adopting it early on is I, when I was observing very young teachers, they asked students to make PowerPoints with images to go with the speeches they were making. And the teachers didn't have any training in thinking about multi multimodal composition. And so the students would pick the first image that came up on a Google image search. And I could see that actually to teach multimodal composition, you have to teach something about what's the best image, what's the most appropriate image. So much intellectual labor to put together these tools and the judgment and the experience and the computational adroitness that you have to possess to take something from ChatGPT and feed it into another program and even know that's going to be a good question to ask. That's the kind of stuff that we've always been talking about in college classes, right? Precisely, right. You got to learn how to learn it. In the end, this is what's going to happen in the field. There are going to be people who just push the button and they take what they get. And then there's going to be people who know how to use the tool and you're going to see a divide right, between capabilities. I wonder about the kind of tension between a kind of I-aided creation in the form of a web page or a new site or a blog or whatever kind of content that's, that's created with the assistance of the tools you're describing and a platform like TikTok, which is to use Anne's word and almost entirely artisanal, just people talking into it 
and how I think large swaths of the population would get most of their sense of what's happening in the world from other people talking into their phones rather than something that's created much and designed more deliberately. And if there's a tension between those two approaches to build a community, building understanding, sharing information, or if there is some mutuality there where they can inform each other. That's not a question. It's just, I'm wondering if that's something you're thinking about. Certainly we know TikTok has become quite a large search engine so that Google was one, YouTube was two. And obviously TikTok has shown that can change at least among a particular demographic. But I still think there's an opportunity for multimodal content, essentially, right? Put together to create a richer experience. There are plenty of things I go to YouTube for to learn. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of it, in fact, on a daily basis. There's things that I watch that I want to learn. But there are there is simply other content that I want as text, right? And they both have their place. And I can't speak for the future, but at least in my future, I'm going to continue to rely on both. And with Think that a number of people, like say, that I know closely will continue to rely on both for sure. So I think the web is big and I, long story short, I think there's opportunity for all of it to thrive. But I guess there's a question with, say, the content you're talking about, because what's going to happen is people are going to start producing a lot of that in an automated way. And I would suspect that content does not perform as well against its pure content, like the real TikTok content would be my hunch. We'll see if that proves to be true. Matt, this has been so interesting and I've learned so much both about artificial intelligence and also about the field of business anthropology. So thank you a ton for your time. Really grateful. And we want to ask you the question we ask all our guests at the end of the episode, which is to, it's not really a question, but to invite you to tell us about a teacher that's mattered to you. So can you think of someone in your distant or recent past that's been important in the shaping of your non-artificial, artisanal intelligence? I mean, I think it'd be great if you just said chat GPT is the best, (laughs) just no pressure, but. (laughs) Yeah, and I'm sure people will say such things in the future. So I had a professor in undergrad and in grad where I got my MBA and it's a very interesting story there. So one day I had expressed to him when I was in my graduate MBA program that I had an interest in the future of studying anthropology. And we had never talked about anthropology to date up to that point, but he always took a very, so his name is, sorry, I should say, his name is Dr. Rex Doom Doom at Marywood University. He actually just retired. And he always taught from a very business, from a very humanistic perspective. And the Marywood like Fordham is very much about the whole person. And there's a lot of that in general, but he took it to another dimension and was in a sense teaching like human centered design before it became a popular term. Yeah. He didn't, he probably didn't know that term. He wasn't intending to play off of that, at least in the beginning, but that's essentially what he was teaching. And so because of that, he and I just saw eye to eye on a lot of things. And one day, again, I tell him that I'm interested in studying anthropology. And he starts telling me the story about how when he was getting his PhD at University of Binghamton, his advisor was married to an anthropologist who worked at IBM or as a consultant for IBM. I don't recall at the oh, moment. Oh, so cool. And so because of that, she influenced his lead advisor to think about software development in a different way. And so he learned how to write software requirements from this very humanistic perspective. And they wrote books on that. And so that's how I studied all of it. And then eventually I go back and I get this anthropology degree. And it very much looks like what he's doing, albeit in different terms. And as much as some of my interest, I didn't identify the interest that there were the connection. I would say that he certainly shaped a lot of my thinking in that space and directly led me to anthropology. So I'm very grateful for that and for all that he's done. I love that. And I love that the question seems almost to have emerged out of a sense that he would be interested in the fact of your intellectual interest in anthropology. You just had a feeling. And then there was this whole history behind it, a whole genealogy. That's really cool. Matt, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Anne. Thanks, Steve.
Twice Over Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, with new episodes appearing every two weeks. For host and guest bios and show notes, please visit our website, twiceoverpodcast.com. You can email us at twiceoverpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.